Hello, my name's Alice Swain and I am the officer at the Salvation Army in Mould. Today I want to share with you some thoughts I've been having about Palm Sunday. Now have you ever had one of those days where nothing seems to go as you've planned it? Maybe you spent the day imagining the chicken stew you'd be having for tea, only to come home and realise you hadn't put the slow cooker on. Maybe you had a stack of work to do, but when you went to do it, you realised the one document you needed wasn't there. Or maybe someone in your family falls ill and all the plans that you've had to go out and enjoy time together have to be changed. They're all little examples, but all things that have happened to me and have left me thinking this isn't what I planned. Maybe you're not what I planned isn't just about little things, but about big things too. There have been times in my life where I've uttered that phrase, full of desperation. When I led the funeral of the most wonderful young man who was promoted to glory at just the age of 29. When I heard the doctor say to my mother-in-law, this is terminal, there's nothing we can do. Or month after month of failing to become pregnant, I've whispered that phrase and even shouted that phrase towards God. At the moment, we all find ourselves in a not what I planned situation. Some days this can look good, like the days I've spent preparing thoughts and phoning up members of our church and checking in on them, all from the comfort of my hammock in the sun. But some days it's been incredibly bleak. When my stepdaughter sends me pictures of her newborn son, my very first grandchild, and I haven't even met him and I don't even know when I'm going to get that chance. As I've been pondering these emotions, I've been thinking towards Easter. I've been considering how the Easter story may be even more relevant this year than before. The message of sorrow and grief entwined with the powerful narrative of hope. And as I look at this special Sunday, which we call Palm Sunday, God's spoken to me in a really new way. Now, I always love Palm Sunday. I love to picture in my mind's eye what it may have been like on that day. Listen to this account from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, in the Passion Translation, and consider the scene. Now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at the place of the stables near Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead and said to them, As soon as you enter the village ahead, you will find a donkey's colt tethered there that has never been ridden. Untie it. Bring it to me, and if anyone asks what are you t taking it, tell them, the master needs it and will send it back to you soon. So, they went and found the colt outside in the street, tied to a gate. When they started to untie it, some people standing there said, why are you untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, the master needs it and he'll send it back to you soon. So the bystanders let them go. The disciples brought the colt to Jesus and piled their cloaks and prayer shawls on the young donkey and Jesus rode upon it. Many people carpeted the road in front of him with their cloaks and their prayer shawls, while others gathered palm branches and spread them before him. Jesus rode in the very centre of the procession, whilst crowds were going before him and behind him. They all shouted in celebration, bring the victory. We welcome the one coming with blessings of being sent from the Lord, Yahweh. Blessings rest on this kingdom he ushers in right now. The kingdom of our father David. Bring us the victory in the highest realms of heaven. Jesus rode through the gates of Jerusalem and up to the temple. After looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve to spend the night. For it was already late in the day. Imagine the joy and celebration that was taking place. Now this translation suggests that not only cloaks were laid before Jesus's feet, but maybe even their own talents or prayer shawls. I love that picture that for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had prayed for a savior whilst wearing their prayer shawls. And that day they laid them at the feet of the very savior. Fast forward a few days and now picture this scene. Less than a week later, in Luke chapter 23 from the Passion Translation. Pilate gathered the people together with the high priests and all the religious leaders of the nation and told them, You've presented this man to me and charged him with stirring a rebellion amongst the people. But I say to you that I've examined him here in your presence 
and have put him on trial. My verdict is that none of the charges you've brought against him are true. I find no fault in him. And I sent him to Antipas, son of Herod, who also, after questioning him, found him not guilty. Since he's done nothing deserving of death, I've decided to punish him with a severe flogging and release him. For it was Pilate's custom to honour the Jewish holiday by releasing a prisoner. When the crowd heard this, they went wild. Erupting with anger, they cried out, No, take this one away and release Barabbas. For Barabbas had been thrown in prison for robbery and murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, tried to convince them it was best to let Jesus go. But they cried out over and over, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time, Pilate asked the crowd, What evil crime has this man committed that I should have him crucified? I haven't found one thing that warrants a death sentence. I'll have him flogged severely and then release him. But the people and the high priest, shouting like a mob, screamed out at the top of their lungs, No! Crucify him! Crucify him! Finally, their shouts and screams succeeded. Pilate caved into the crowd and ordered that the will of the people be done. Then he released the guilty murderer Barabbas, as they'd insisted, and handed Jesus over to be crucified. What a shocking turn of events. The people who had been shouting hallelujah were now shouting crucify him. What had happened in that time to make the crowd change so much? For many of those who'd rejoiced at the procession, their reason would likely to have been, this is not what I planned. You see, Jesus in his procession on that first Palm Sunday was fulfilling a prophecy in scripture, a prophecy of what their saviour would be. Zechariah 9 verse 9 to 10 says this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariots of, of, of Ephraim and the horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. For many, this paints a picture of a mighty warrior succeeding in battle. A warrior so strong that peace will come as he defeats every other enemy. His rule shall come from fear. People in Israel were living under Roman occupation. Many had to compromise their religion in order to keep the Roman rules. The Romans were harsh leaders who gave little care or thought to their religion and culture. Rome was the enemy. When Jesus processed through Jerusalem riding the donkey, they saw in him the hope of a mighty warrior arriving to overthrow the Roman leaders. As he went up to the very gates of the temple, I'm sure they imagined that he would declare victory and their emancipation would begin. However, this was not what God had planned. A week later, Jesus stood before the crowd, misunderstood, and looking at the faces who had shouted his praise, now shouting for his death. The crowds, the religious leaders, even some of the disciples missed the point entirely. God wasn't doing what they had planned. Have we ever felt like that? That God hasn't done what we had planned? I don't know about you, but there have been many times when I felt like that crowd. I don't understand what God is doing, and I feel that the plan for the resolution of the problem is far better when I thought of it than what God's got planned. However, as Jesus rose into, rode into Jerusalem, he knew. He knew what God had planned was greater than what people had planned. The people planned freedom from Roman occupation. God planned freedom from sacrifice. The people planned a mighty warrior for Israel. God had planned a victorious king of all kings. The people planned freedom to visit the temple, the place where God dwelt. God planned that every man be the temple, where God dwelt with them at every hour 
of every day. You see, this is the thing about God's plans. They're above what we can ask and imagine. As the Salvation Army in the UK declared at the beginning of this year, God is infinitely more. Now, I know that that doesn't always make it easy. Even Jesus acknowledged in the Garden of Gethsemane the weight of sorrow that was found in God's plan for him. He was in so much pain in that Garden of Gethsemane, thinking about the suffering that was laid before him, that he even sweat drops of blood. Sometimes in the difficulties we face, we can't see how this will be turned to good or where his plan might be. We simply don't understand God's mind or his plans for us. Paul writes about this in Romans. Paul was a man who was persecuted and tortured. He was on shipwrecks, he was attacked by mobs and faced all sorts of injustices. In Romans 11 he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We can rest assured that whatever we may face, God's plan within that situation will always be to show his love. The love so deep that he sent his only son to endure torture and death for our good. A love so strong that it conquered death so that we may be in relationship with him. As we approach an Easter that looks so very different from what we may have planned, let us look to the Father and spend time seeking his plans for our life in this difficult time. If you're confused that this time isn't what you planned, or you simply can't see what God is doing, then take the time to come before him and pray. In the comments will be a link to a beautiful song that's sung by choirs and songsters up and down the country. It's called Bow the Knee. But before we end this time together, just take a moment to listen as I read the powerful words to this song. There are moments in our journey following the Lord where God illumines every step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each move he makes. When the path grows dim and our questions have no answers, turn to him. Bow the knee. Trust the heart of your father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee. Lift your eyes towards heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan, in the presence of the king, bow the knee. There are days when clouds surround us and the rain begins to fall. The cold and lonely winds won't seem to blow. And there seems to be no reason for the suffering we feel. We're tempted to believe God does not know. When the storms arise, don't forget we live by faith and not by sight. Bow the knee. Trust the heart of your father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee. Lift your eyes towards heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of the king, bow the knee.